We're back again. We are going to be this week in Genesis chapter 4. Um, we're going to take the first 10 verses of chapter 4. Uh, as we always do, let me pray first that the Lord bless this time. Lord, we pray that you would uh, guide us in your word. Your word is not only precious, but it's full of uh, unlimited information. We pray not only that we would understand what is embedded in it, as you would allow, but that your Holy Spirit would apply these things to our lives, because it is the living and active word. So uh, pray that it minister to us. So we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's turn to Genesis 4. story of Cain and Abel. All right, let me read <clears throat> the first verse. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. So here we have the record of the first pregnancy, the first birth. Uh, Cain is the first child born. He uh, His I guess the best, uh, my best understanding of pronunciation of Cain in Hebrew is Cain, is how it's pronounced. It's interesting, and we'll get to this as we go on, because names mean things in Hebrew, and usually they mean a lot of things. His name means an acquisition or a possession. And I think as the story goes on, uh, you'll see more why that's true. So, Eve declares that she has a son, <clears throat> a man-child, in Hebrew, ish, a boy. It's also the verb conate for this is, interestingly, Adam. And uh, Adam means, literally, to be read. And it appears that it's because when Cain is born, he comes out and he has a reddish, you know, color to him, and that's why so the baby skin, apparently, is why this is mentioned. Now, I think it's very possible that Eve thought that this might be the fulfillment of the promise in Genesis 3.15, that out of her would come this person, okay, the seed, and uh, I think that this, the, the, the thing that's interesting about that is that if indeed she did think that, she couldn't possibly have been more wrong, yeah. okay? Uh, matter of fact, we're going to look at a bunch of New Testament verses. Cain is mentioned a n number of times, but if you go all the way back to the end of the book of Jude, you have this rather ominous, it's Jude, and I think it's verse 11, here, uh, statement about Cain. Jude. He says, <clears throat> verse 11, woe to them, for they've gone the way of Cain. For pay they have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam. You know, the Old Testament story in Numbers about Balaam. And perished in the rebellion of Korah. We you know the rebellion of Korah where the ground opened up and <coughs> the rebels were taken down. In the so he talks about the way of Cain. Cain is notorious for evil. He's notorious for that which is satanic. And there are multiple, we'll look at some other verses also about Cain in a minute. So back to Genesis chapter 3, I'm chapter 4, I'm sorry. Um, now, <clears throat> let's read verse 2 of chapter 4. And again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now, the second son 
his he's called Habel, Abel. Interestingly, his name means breath or vapor or transitory. Okay. We think of that verse actually in James chapter 4, verse 14, where it says, Your life is just but a vapor. Okay. Same idea. It's transitory. And so in the same way, he's named that that he will be, quote, transitory. His life was very short. His life was quite short. And because because of sin leading to death, the human lifespan, of course, is now limited. Eve, of course, is going to find out very soon how limited his lifespan is because of what occurs. That says that Abel was a herdsman. He was a flock keeper. He was a shepherd. And he followed, apparently, the mandate by God that originally was to Adam. Remember, Adam was to to watch and uh, and to name even the animals, observe them. And so, apparently, this is what Abel did, too. Now, it states that Abel was this herdsman, but Cain was the tiller of the ground. He was a farmer. He grew produce. Now, I think this shows an interesting inclination, not that the inclination is in and of itself wrong, but there was an inclination in each to do something that was unique to them and to their interests. And of course, we see that that neither growing the crops nor raising the animals was better than the other one. Matter of fact, when you when we go hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years in the future to the time of Moses Mm -hmm. and we see the sacrificial system set up. We have sacrifices of animals, but we also have sacrifices Mm -hmm. of produce and grain and grain. Even wine is a libation. Okay. Is also another type of offering. So again, neither right or wrong, good or bad per se in either of these things. Now, it is interesting, though, that Abel's occupation in his life is prophetic. So turn, if you would, to Matthew, chapter 23. Matthew 23. We're going to start in verse 34. This is Jesus speaking. He says, Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That upon you may fall the guilt of of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who is the son of Barakai, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Now, the significance of this, if you have a, if you had a Bible and you had the books of the Old Testament in it, you see that the reference to Zechariah the son of Berechiah here is actually found in 2 Chronicles 24, verses 20 through 22. At that point in time, the Hebrew Bible, the first book obviously has always been and is Genesis, but the last book in the order of books then was 2 Chronicles. Okay? So basically what he's saying is that from the beginning or the first time to the last time, you have a constant history of those who are righteous being martyred, ultimately, of course, being found in Jesus himself. Also, if you will turn from Matthew to chapter 12 of Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 
Hebrews chapter 12. <coughs> See another reference here that is, shows the prophetic nature of, of Abel. Verse 24, 1224. He says, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So again, Abel's blood was the first blood, the first martyr, the first victim of sin, okay? But it culminates in the final blood, that being the blood spelled by Jesus himself on the cross, okay? Now, so Jesus was a type of Abel's murder, of his martyrdom. Abel, it we're told, was a shepherd. He was a worshiper of the Lord, secondly. He was a righteous man, it says. And also, he was a martyr. In, that, in those ways, he was like Jesus, again. A type, a parallel. Okay? Now, back to Genesis 4. And let's read... Verses 3, 4, and 5, and take those. So starting in 3. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. And Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Now, if you read commentary after commentary, you have almost every imaginable idea about why Cain's offering was not accepted. Okay? There's all kinds of different theories. I think that the truth is found when you look at the Hebrew language itself, and I'm going to show that to you in a second. So basically, it starts out saying, in, in a course of time or at a designated time, if you want to put it that way, all right, that God then appoints a time for offering, you know, could have been very well Shabbat, the seventh day. Doesn't say it's the seventh day, but certainly it's very possible. So Cain brings his offering. The word for offering is the word minkah, minkah, and it means a gift, a tribute, an offering or a sacrifice. Now, interestingly, note, Cain brings his offering first. True? Before his brother Abel, all right? In other words, Cain starts out well, and he brings the produce from the ground, which, as we've said, there's nothing inherently wrong with that as a sacrifice. So there's nothing that Cain right at this moment is doing that's wrong. You agree? All right. Now, Abel next brings a different sacrifice. Notice that both worked, both produced, both offered a portion of what they produced. Mm -hmm. Right? Abel brings, though, what are called the firstlings. That is, in Hebrew, it's the word bikor, and it means the firstborn, and he also brings of that that, quote, fat portions. What that literally means is the choicest, the best, the most costly. That's what the idea in Hebrew of the fat portions is. So he brought the best he has. Yes. Now, it doesn't say that Cain didn't bring the best of his produce. It never says he didn't. Okay? It just mentions that Abel had this other type of sacrifice and brought them. Now, if you would... Turn, if you would, I want you to look at something that's important, I think. And that's go to the book of Psalms. And we're going to look at Psalm 51. David makes a very, inspired by the Holy Spirit, makes a very interesting and important statement. We're going to read verses 16 and 17 of Psalm 51. 
David says, For thou dost not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. Thou art not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou will not despise. Now think about it. Thou will not despise that. Okay? We're going to learn very quickly that God does not accept Cain's sacrifice. But we've already said there's nothing wrong with his sacrifice per se. So what must be wrong about the nature of Cain's sacrifice? His attitude, his heart. His heart. That's the thing that's wrong. Not what he brought. He was the first one to bring it. It was a legitimate offering. But there's something wrong with his attitude that God detects. Now, we also seem to indicate that somehow Abel's heart attitude was correct. And Cain's, of course, was not. So the Lord, quote, honored or had regard, it says. The word for have regard is the, is the Hebrew word shaha. And it means literally to look at with interest or gaze upon favorably. favorably. So, in the Hebrew, in this sentence, what you realize in the in the text is the emphasis in the grammar is not upon the two sacrifices that they brought, but the, the, the issue of gazing in regard has to do with the two men, Cain and Abel, okay? So that's the focus in the grammar of what God is looking at. Now, <clears throat> Cain's response is that he had, and let's go back to our text in in, uh, Genesis 4. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Okay, verse 5. The word in Hebrew, the two words in Hebrew are miad shara. It means very, very extremely angry. To burn inside, literally, it means in the Hebrew. Okay? We would use a, another word, probably to describe this rage. So, Cain becomes enraged. Now, the question is why? Jealous. Why did he become so enraged? I, I think we're going to see, late, as we go on, pride is definitely a part of it, okay? We're going to see his attitude as we go on in the next few verses. I think that's a part of it. But I think that the thing that catches him and he can't get over is that it just doesn't seem fair, okay? There's nothing that leads more commonly to anger than quote, it doesn't seem fair to you. All you have to do is have a three or four year old child in your home. And what are you going to hear regularly coming out of their mouth? It's not fair. It's not fair. It's just endemic to human nature to be preoccupied with what you, we, us, in our limited and prejudiced viewpoint view as being fair, okay? And when it's not fair, we get angry and resentful about it. Would you agree? It's not fair. It's part of the original sin in the first place because they did not accept God's explanation that God's will was not good enough. Exactly. It's a good point. In the limit that God put them on not being able to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil seem to Eve first not fair as we went through that before somehow the Nakash got them convinced and propagandized into the idea that God was holding out now it says that Cain's countenance fell the word countenance is the word panem in Hebrew And it literally means the expression on your face. So, in other words, he became 
very distressed and very un had a very, very angry, unhappy look on his face. Now, say this. Isn't it interesting that even though he's upset, extremely upset, that God is not accepting of his sacrifice, notice what he doesn't do. Cain doesn't ever say to the Lord, why? He doesn't ask the Lord what's wrong. He doesn't ask, what may I need to change for it's acceptable? Okay. He simply is super obsessively focused on how offended he feels about his apparent rejection. Okay. He can't get over the fact that what he did, quote, is, quote, rejected by God. This speaks, I believe, as Rob just mentioned, to his pride and arrogance. He is an arrogant man. And as we get further into this chapter, you're going to see how arrogant he is, and you're going to see how arrogant his relatives are. He has a whole generation of people that come from him who are unbelievably arrogant. Now, if you would, turn to 1 John. All the way to the back, to the right. Go to 1 John. Because we're picking out these verses that have to do with Cain, his sin, his attitude. We're going to go to 1 John 3. We're going to read verses 11 and 12, starting at 11, 1 John 3. For this is the message which you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain. See, here's another example of him being used in the New Testament. Who slew his brother, and for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Now, the deeds he's talking about are not the offering. That's not the deeds he's referring to. It's his response that are, that are his deeds. Okay? Now, so it's his reaction to this apparent rejection. Note also, turn, since you're in 1 John, turn to your left to the Gospels. Go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus kind of makes, I believe, an allusion to this event in Matthew 5. Starting verse 23. Jesus says, If therefore you are presenting an offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your offering there by the altar and go your way and first be reconciled to your brother, then come and present your offering. In other words, if your attitude is not right about your fellow person, then your offering is not going to be accepted because your attitude's wrong. Reconcile yourself to the person, and then go back and offer the offering, okay? Again, it's an attitude issue. So Cain turns his anger into arrogance, bitterness, and of course, he projects all of this against his brother Abel. At this point in time, what has Abel done to him? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. He projects his anger, even though his issue is actually with the Lord, right? He projects all of this at his brother. Okay. Genesis 4. Let's read a couple more verses. Genesis 4. Let's read 6 and 7. Then the Lord said to Cain, 
Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you don't do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desires for you, but you must master it. Now, God from here on asks a series of rhetorical questions to Cain. Okay, why does he do that? For repentance. Ultimately, hopefully. Okay, instead of Cain being so focused on his own anger and on his projected anger towards Abel, what is God trying to get him to do by asking him these rhetorical questions? He's, exactly. He's trying to get Cain to think about and search himself, you know, to understand what he's doing, to understand why he's doing what he's doing. That's what God's trying to get him to do by asking these rhetorical questions. Now, I want to note something here that is often, I believe, misunderstood as it's taught, particularly in the New Testament. And that is, <clears throat> there is a major difference between righteous and unrighteous anger. There are both. Yeah. There's not just unrighteous anger. That's common. It's the most common, undoubtedly. But there's also righteous anger. Let's, let's look at two examples. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. I've always found this verse interesting. Ephesians chapter 4. And part of why I find it interesting, we're going to look at 20, verses 26 and 27. Let me read it. Starting in verse, Ephesians 4, 26. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. And we might as well even go into verse 28. Let him who steals, steal no more, but rather let him labor performing with his own hands what is good in order that he may have something to share with him who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only such a word which is edification, etc. Okay? The point is, in the, gram in the grammar, it's a command. He doesn't say, if you want to, or if you think about it once in a while, or maybe you might consider it. He says, be angry, but sin not. Okay? Verse 25, the verse before it, he says, therefore, laying aside fal falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members one another. In other words, righteous anger is an anger that is focused on the truth. It's an anger that's focused on the right, and it's something that is focused against error. Do you have a right? to be angry out of concern for your brother or sister who are blatantly doing something that's wrong and harming themselves and other people? The answer is yes, you do, okay? That is a confrontation and there are correct confrontations. No confrontation is fun for people if you find it fun, then you have the rat wrong attitude about it, okay? It's something you do in a calculated way, not because you are so consumed with emotion, but because you're consumed with the problem at hand and the need for it to be confronted. That's righteous anger, okay? There's also plenty of unrighteous anger. Turn further to your right to... The book of James, right after Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. This you know, my beloved brethren, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve 
the righteousness of God. Here is unrighteous anger. I can't stand how you've treated me. I can't stand that you're not listening to me. I can't stand fill in the blank, okay? People that become angry for those reasons, that's unrighteous anger. It's almost always consumed with the self. The unrighteous one is. It's very difficult to control. It is sometimes very difficult to control because our natural instinct is to be preoccupied with ourself. Okay? And again, there's a proper concern for self and there's an improper concern for self. You know? But don't forget, though, in the midst of the discussion about anger, that there is a righteous one. And sometimes we're called to act that way, to act on it. Moses himself certainly had righteous anger many times. You don't have to turn here, but in Exodus 32, 15 through 20, he spent 40 days on top of the mountain with God. Okay? God has inscribed two tablets on stone for him, the Ten Commandments. He carries them down the mountain after being up there during this time. And as he comes down far enough, what does he see? They already oh, built the uh, <laughs> golden, golden calf. calf. Yeah. His brother Aaron acts like a moron, okay, in this case, builds the calf for the people. They're worshiping calf. They're in lascivious <coughs> depravity and sexual sin. And after having been on the mountain with the Lord and here having these Ten Commandments from the mouth of God written by the hand of God, what does he do with them? In fury about what they're doing, he throws them down and breaks them into pieces. Nowhere ever does it say that God was upset with Moses for doing that. God doesn't confront Moses about it. He has to make another copy eventually, but Moses was right to be angry about what they were doing, okay? He was right about it. He was frequently angry at them for the things that they did. Jesus had righteous anger. Oh, yeah. the Pharisees. Threw the people out of the temple. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Pharisees. Money changers. Yeah, the hypocrisy of the money changers, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus regularly had angry confrontations with them. So I shouldn't get feel bad if I get mad at the politicians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I guess I guess that depends honestly on the question of what do you expect from them, and that's the key. Now, back in Genesis 4, there is what I call the existential moment. Okay? That is... God says, okay, and we're going to look at verse 7. If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching the door and it's desirous for you, but you must master it. Now, this is the existential moment. Cain has an important choice to make. Number one continue on and breed more and more anger and rage in himself, or his option is to, quote, do well. The Hebrew word is yatab, and it means to do the right thing. It literally means to do the right thing in a way in which you ultimately become cheerful. It's really quite interesting, isn't it? So, there is, therefore, a path to acceptance and resolution and solution that God offers Cain. Do you see it? Okay. If Cain will choose it. It brings up this very interesting question that we all contend with at some point in our own experience. How long do we plan to nurse a grudge? You know, how long are we going to beat this thing into the ground? We all struggle with that to some extent, don't we? Now, 
Notice that his attitude or his countenance, his facial expression, can be, quote, lifted up, it says. It's the Hebrew word seat, and it means to raise up, to exalt, to dignify, or to be honored. So not only can he resolve this issue if he reacts the right way, he can be honored as a result of solving this issue the right way. That's what the Hebrew seems to indicate. Now, it's interesting, <coughs> if you go to the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, the word there is the word orthos. Is it interesting? The word orthos. It means a correct course or path towards a proper standard or goal. Orthos. So, this is one option. I think it's interesting... I'm going to turn to Revelation chapter 3. I'm going to read you what is, of course, a very famous verse. It's verse 20. Behold, 3, Revelation 3.20. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him, and he with me. Okay? Here is the opportunity. Jesus is the sin offering that stands at the door and knocks to those who are willing to open it. Therefore, there's a choice that's made. If they open the door, the choice is life. If they don't open the door, the choice is death, right? Mm -hmm. And in terms of salvation, it means their own death, <clears throat> the death of eternity, the, the death of hell. Now, here's the contrast, because remember, it's either or, he's saying to Cain. If you don't do well, if you don't do the right thing, if you don't respond correctly to this situation, <coughs> then he says that sin is, quote, crouching at the door. The word crouching is the word rabas, and it means literally to lie down or to submit to or to be passive against or to give into. Okay, so he's saying if you don't do well and you submit to sin, you're going to be like laying down under its control. <clears throat> and its desire, it says, is for you. The, the word desire in Hebrew means a longing, a craving, or a passion. And literally is used typically in the Hebrew in the text for a desire to dominate or to enslave, right? Now, this Old Testament passage, I believe, is used by Paul in the book of Romans to teach an expanded New Testament application. Turn to Romans 6. What begins in the old, finishes in the new, right? Romans 6, and we're going to start in verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but rather, see the either or, but rather present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. Present yourself in a way that's going to bring life, okay? Alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not, see the word Paul uses, master over you, for you are not under law but under grace. 
Now, let me read also 15 through 18, very famous passage by Paul. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resolving in righteousness? Okay? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, in other words, prior to your salvation, perpetually so, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from the power of sin, you became slaves of righteousness. His point, you're going to be the slave of one of two things. You're either going to be the, quote, slave of righteousness, which will lead to life, or you're going to be the slave of sin, which will lead to death. Those are the options for human nature. And I think that we see the beginning of this teaching right here, right in Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 4. <clears throat> now, the word master there that he says, because he says sin is crouching at your door and wants to master you, back in, in, in uh, Genesis 4, the, the, the word is mashal, and it means to reign or to control. The image in the Hebrew that is used here is of a predatory animal waiting to pounce and devour. That's the image that's in the grammar and the allusion in the Hebrew. So if Cain responds poorly, then sin will, quote, eat him alive. Which is exactly what happens. And that will occur in all his generations also, as we'll see soon. Okay. Now, let's go back and let's read verses 8, 9, and 10 in chapter 4. And Cain told Abel, his brother, and it came about <clears throat> when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? I mean, how many people were in the world at this point, you know? <laughs> it would have been really hard to keep, keep tabs on them, you know? All right, verse 10, and he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. All right, now, Cain says to Abel, in essence, let's go out in the field, okay? This is subterfuge. It's an excuse and a ploy and shows very obviously premeditation. He has a plan and he's going to kill his brother. Now, as a result of him killing his brother, Sin now spreads from what was at first initial disobedience of eating the fruit of the tree that was prohibited by Adam and Eve. And look what it ends up becoming very, very quickly. It turns into violence and bloodshed and the death of one's own brother. You know, it ends up beginning to explode like a pandemic which almost is like a wildfire, which you're going to see very quickly as we keep going in the next couple chapters, consuming and destroying as it goes. You know, God creates life. God creates mankind. Cain decides that he has a right to arbitrarily end his brother's life that God created. And that's part of the heinous element of murder. 
that one believes that arbitrarily for their own reasons, they have the right to end a life that God himself caused to be. It's actually the, the knowledge that they gained from the Nakhta. Yes, the it is. Yeah, they were completely hoodwinked by the Nakash. Yeah, they gained knowledge, horrific knowledge, absolutely horrific. So Cain decides he has a right to end his brother's life and of course now sin very clearly leads to death just as god told adam it would lead to death right interestingly now adam's own son dies adam is now the personal has personal experience of what it means that sin leads to death you think cain knew that he was actually going to kill because he had never Killed, there was never another person killed until this time. Did yeah. Cain really he, realize what he was doing to Abel? Absolutely. It's premeditation. Absolutely it's premeditation. You know? He learned it from the fact that they could kill animals now? Could be. It could be. You know, uh, very much. It's not that they never saw anything die. Okay? <laughs> but now there's this new application to apply it to killing a person. Turn to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15. Here's Jesus' comment about sin. Starting verse 18 of Matthew 15. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and those defile the man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, what's the next word? Murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, slanders. Okay? All these things, Jesus says, defile the man. It starts with the attitude. It starts in the mind. It starts with the intention. Now, interestingly, again, it says that Cain killed Abel. The word there in the Hebrew is the word harag. And it's an interesting word because it means to kill a sacrificial animal. And is not the word that's used in Exodus 20, verse 13, where it says, thou shalt not murder. Different word. So Cain, again, even by the Hebrew, that, that Abel is the first sacrifice to sin. He's the sacrificial lamb, the first sacrifice to sin. Now notice that the next rhetorical question by God, where's Abel? In, that, in other words, because God says, I sensed his blood was spilled on the ground, okay? already you know the question he's asking is what have you done do you realize in essence what you've done Cain's response goes from bad to worse okay I I wrote in my notes here he lies and denies okay he lies. A yeah, he, <laughs> he lies about the situation and he denies any responsibility or knowledge about it. Notice what he does not do. Again, a lot of Cain's sins start out with what he doesn't do. He doesn't confess. He doesn't admit. He doesn't seek forgiveness. But he lies literally into the face of God the creator. Now think about that. He lies literally into the face of God. God's directly speaking to him. He has the hubris and the arrogance to do that. In Numbers 32, verse 23 is a famous verse. It says, your sin will, seek, will find you out. And indeed, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. In this case, I always wondered 
when God, when he was talking to God, was God not in a person or an incarnate Christ, or was he talking, this voice was coming? That's never, I don't understand it. It's hard to know exactly in what form God is when he speaks, but clearly it is direct and personal. Okay, clearly, you know, uh, I, I think that's certainly the, the case. Now, notice he says, he said, am I my brother's keeper? The word keeper is the word samar, and it literally means a guardian or a watchman. In other words, am I supposed to be responsible for him? Okay. You know, he's like not a very smart person. Um, well, he's he's blinded by his own rage. Yeah, That's the problem, arrogance. and his arrogance. He's so, lying, he's lying to God. He's arguing with God. Absolutely. He's angry at God. He's angry at God. His attitude can be described as defiant, arrogant, callous, and without any fear. He's talking to his own creator. He has no fear, even though he's done an absolutely horrific thing. In other words, we learn something very important here. Sin poisons the conscience. It poisons the conscience. Cain apparently feels no connection to his brother, no bond to his brother, no attachment to his brother Abel. And as a result of apparently having none of that, he's able to act like a monster. We see that today. We see Maybe it today. It Look at those that commit genocide. Okay? They put to death, in some cases, millions of people without any sense of connection to them whatsoever. <laughs> Look at the psychopath who, who, who's predatory against anyone that he chooses to be and has absolutely no concern whatsoever. Yes? Why Cain and Abel just, you know, wanted to bring offering at the first place? Because it says there was an appointed day. Apparently God had told them to bring an offering. A designated time, remember I told you, on a like designated Sabbath. time. Mm -hmm. That it could have been the Sabbath. Could have been the Sabbath. That's why. Okay? I think the point is this. God set Our up the first Sabbath. <laughs> well, I mean, okay, I'm kidding you. At any rate, the point is you have to wonder every time you see a crime story. You know, how could they do that? And again, the reason is because there's absolutely no bond or attachment. There's zero empathy that the person has for the victim. Zero. Because the devil is just well, thinking they, yeah. uh, they are God. And where was the enemy at that time? Like, where was the enemy when Cain went out? The serpent. Yeah, yeah, the serpent. Where was he? Was he he was working part, through he was working through Cain. He was part of that. Because Cain is the seed of the serpent. Okay. Arise behind, behind his shoulder. Exactly. He is the first obvious example of the seed of the serpent. That's Cain. Now it's interesting. I've been to Jerusalem. Gary, you've been to Jerusalem. You guys were in Jerusalem before. Mm -hmm. Did you go to the Holocaust Museum? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Did you guys go? Okay. Very moving mm -hmm. place. There's a plaque out front of the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. Okay. The plaque reads, quote, listen, your brother's blood cries out. That's the plaque in front of the Holocaust Museum. How true. Cain has now opened Pandora's box, which cannot be closed and will lead to every imaginable atrocity 
ever conceived by mankind over the next 6,000 years. The only solution to it, if you want to put it this way, is maybe two. There's a personal solution and there's a permanent solution. The personal solution is for the heart and mind to be renewed by the love of God, the Holy Spirit, so that you desire to love your fellow man. The permanent solution is the return of Christ to the earth. It's only then when he rules personally that the atrocities that have gone on for 6,000 years will then come to an end. Now, are we our brother's keeper? I found 85 verses in the Bible, and there's probably plenty more that indicate that we indeed are our brother's keeper. So let's look at five of them, okay? Let's start in the Old Testament. We'll just do this quickly. Go to Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs 17. Verse 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. What does that tell you? It speaks of loyalty, even in the face of difficulty of your friend, right? All right. Proverbs 17, 17. Like David and Jonathan. Yeah. Now let's let's go to Matthew, a very, very famous set of verses, but we can't overlook these. Chapter 22, verse 36. Teacher, what is the great commandment of the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Verse 39, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor have your, as yourself. On these two commandments depends the whole law and all the prophets. It's all summarized in those two things. Let's go, to, let's go to Romans, chapter 15. <clears throat> Keep going to the right. Romans 15. Verses 1 and 2. Now, we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those who are without strength and not just please ourselves. Let each one of us please his neighbor for his, that would be his neighbor's good, to your neighbor's edification. Pretty clear, isn't it? Isn't it interesting how often when people act in weakness or suffering, or inability, what's the first thing that people tend to do? Frequently, they make jest or make fun of them instead of showing compassion to them. Let's go to Galatians chapter 6 from Romans. Past 2 Corinthians to Galatians chapter 6. Again, verses 1 and 2. Brethren, even if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are, emphasize the word spiritual, 
Restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. We just read the law of Christ, didn't we? In Matthew 22. Now, finally, go to James, past Hebrews, James. Chapter 1. Last verse of chapter 1, 27. <clears throat> this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God, our Father, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world, to help those who have a hard time having help, to help the disadvantaged, to help the poor, to help the needy. So, are we our brother's keeper? Absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Oh, what makes that difficult, though? How would how Jewish people love Hamas killing them? He says, I will kill you if I get a chance. Should you love them and help them? <laughs> These things are... Well, sometimes. there are differences between normal civil conditions and warfare. You know, the one case in which killing is approved is in legitimate war, right? That's one. It's also approved in another case, capital punishment, right? There are cases in which it's allowed but it's prescribed by God that it's allowed. And it's not arbitrary. A war is declared by a country against some enemy. It isn't that you declare it against the person. It's that there's an edict, right? Sometimes right, sometimes wrong. Even God told Israel to kill the ites. Yes, that's true. Now, let me mention quickly What are the consequences of murder? I'm going to mention just a few of them. There's many more. First, initially there's intense shock and disbelief. Family members of the victim are devastated. The idea of life being normal is now broken. There is a horrific sense of horrible loss, a sense of unbelievable disbelief. Secondly, there are psychological effects. As a result of murder, those that survive often experience depression, intense grief, sleep disturbances, weight loss. Some of them, if they've experienced the actual death of the person, have post-traumatic stress disorder. They typically experience emotional numbing, have social withdrawal, disinterest, and frequently experience what we call survivor guilt. In their own mind, they decide what they should have done that somehow could have prevented the death of this person. Thirdly, there is usually and often some type of social community or community impact. If a heinous death has occurred, you often find an increase of fear in the community, a decreased sense of personal safety, an increased sense of suspicion, and distrust. Fourthly, if there's been a murder over the time of the investigation, in what is usually an extremely lengthy time for a trial, it creates prolonged suffering, a lack of any sense of closure, an increased sense of anger about what seems to be terrible injustice, and often leads to, in people, a desire for revenge. Also, frequently as a result of murder, in the family or relatives of the murdered, there are disagreements among family members 
Often if the child has been killed, there's a neglect of the other children because of the preoccupation and grief of the one who's died. There's increased marital discord, blame, argumentation, and a highly increased risk of divorce. Now, finally, the biggest problem that often ends up being the result down the line of murder is the extreme difficulty with forgiveness. Forgiveness is the only ultimately healthy and true resolution to a horrific tragedy. Now, to finish tonight, I want to read something to you. <clears throat> this is a story, a true story. When New York, uh, New York Police Department officer Stephen McDonald entered Central Park on the afternoon of July 12, 1986, he had no reason to expect anything out of the ordinary. True, there had been a recent string of bicycle thefts, and other petty crimes in the area, he and his partner, Sergeant Peter King, were on the lookout. But it was all routine. It was all just a day's work. And then they came across a cluster of suspicious-looking teens. When the teens recognized the two policemen, they cut and ran. He says, the, the, the officer says, we chased after them, my partner going in one direction and I another, I caught up with some of them about 30 yards away. As I did, I said to them, fellas, I'm a police officer. I'd like to talk with you. Then I asked them their names uh, and where they lived. Finally, I asked them, <coughs> why are you in the park today? While questioning them, one of them I noticed a bulge in his pant leg. He was of actually the youngest boy. Before I knew it, I realized it was gun, and he had fired twice at, at me. As I lay on the ground, my partner says that he stood over me and shot me a third time. Now, they, the, the, of course, the, the EMT was called. They rushed him to the hospital. He says, in the hospital, they did the impossible. They saved me. But my wounds were devastating. The bullet that struck my throat had hit my spine, and I couldn't move my arms or my legs or breathe without a ventilator. In less than a second, I'd gone from being an active police officer to an incapable crime victim. I was paralyzed from the neck down. Now, the boy who shot me, his name was Shavid Jones. Shavid Jones viewed me as an enemy. Shavid Jones didn't see me as a person or as a man with loved ones or as a husband or someone who would soon be a father. He bought into all the stereotypes of his community. The police are racist. They'll, they'll turn violent on you. So arm yourself against the police. And in a sense, I couldn't blame him. Society, his family, the social agencies responsible for him, the welfare system, the people who had made it impossible for his parents to be together and had failed him way before he ever met me in Central Park. I realized that I had to forgive Shavad because I believe that the only thing worse than receiving a bullet in my spine would have been to nurture revenge in my heart. Such an attitude would have extended my injury to my soul, hurting my wife and my soon to be born son and others even more. It's bad enough that the physical effects are permanent, but at least I realized that I could choose and prevent spiritual injury. As I was laying in the hospital bed, when I began to become conscious, I prayed that I would be changed, that the person that I would be 
would re be replaced by something new. The comment in this article says that this officer named Stephen. Today, Stephen is a sought after speaker at schools in and around New York City, holding entire auditoriums captive as he retells his story and launches a dialogue around the broader issues surrounding it. To him, the cycle of violence that plagues so many lives today, including young lives like that of Shravad who shot him, can be overcome only by breaking down the walls that separate people and make them afraid of each other. The best tools for this, he says, are love, respect, and forgiveness. When the officer goes out and speaks, he often quotes Robert F. Kennedy Jr., stating that, quote, the victims of violence are black and white, rich and poor, young and old, famous and unknown, but they are, most important of all, human beings whom other human beings have loved and needed. And somewhere in each address, he finds a way to refer also to Dr. Martin Luther King by saying a quote from King. When I was a very young kid, Dr. King came to my town in New York. My mother went to hear him speak and she was impressed by what he by what she heard. I hope you, that you can be inspired by his words too. Dr. King said that there's some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us, and that which we learn, and, 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 that, and that when we learn this, we'll be more loving and forgiving. Now, that is the only solution to homicide. But it's the hardest of all roads to get to. To forgive the very person that seem to do the worst imaginable thing to you and or to your relative. That's what Jesus did. I was gonna say, yeah. I this know. this is what love your enemy means. And it reminds me of him saying, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. So on the one hand, the one fellow is trying to murder him and he turns around instead of this bitterness and revenge. He shows forgiveness. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. The Amish did that when there was that man who took children hostage and mm -hmm. killed some. Yes. The Amish forgave. Yeah. They did. Okay. Gary, would you close us tonight? I will. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your example. Thank you for giving us a path to mm -hmm. follow. And that we can seek the goodness. And we can rely on you. <coughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for being a loving, yes. tender, giving God. But also a God that has, who can be angry because of our sins. Be with us. Mm -hmm. Let us learn to trust on you, trust you, and lean on you. Yeah. And we mm -hmm. ask these things in your name. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yeah.